okay, we, we can do this. It can be done. All right. Everybody said I couldn't do it today. Well, I'm going to do it. Tuesday. Tuesday was day two of Donald Trump's criminal trial. And once again, he dozed off right in the middle of it. The judge scolded Trump again, this time accusing him of intimidating a potential juror. Six jurors were sworn in, only six more to go, and it's starting to look like opening statements could begin as early as Monday. I'll have more, much more on Donald Trump's trial and whether Trump's popping Ambien, Valium, or both a little later on in the program. What's going on? He's medicated. Why is he falling asleep? And it looks like Speaker Mike Johnson's days are numbered. I'll be talking about that. And we have a poll. I want to know what you think. If you're watching me live right now on YouTube, hop into the chat room and answer this poll. Who will be Speaker on June 1st 2024. Who will be speaker? Who do you think is going to be speaker come June 1st, 2024? Will it be Mike Johnson? Hakeem Jeffries? He's the Democratic minority leader. Donald Trump? A temporary speaker? There was talk before Mike Johnson six months ago. They thought of making Donald Trump the speaker. Or Putin? Who will be speaker on June 1st, 2024? Will it be Mike Johnson, Hakeem Jeffries, Donald Trump, or Putin? I'll have the results of that poll at the end of the show. On Tuesday, six Republican governors from six southern right-to-work states attacked the United Auto Workers Union Drive in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where Volkswagen workers begin voting this week on whether to join the UAW. Sean Fain, the leader of the UAW, coming off the success of last year's strike in Detroit, earlier in the year announced a multi-pronged movement to start flipping non-union auto plants in the South. But in a letter signed by the governors of Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Texas, Workers were urged not to join the UAW, calling unions job killers that, job killers that, and I quote, threaten the values we live by. Unions threaten the values we live by. Voting in the Chattanooga factory begins today. We should have the results by Friday. The Washington Post reports this is now the third attempt since 2014 to unionize the VW factory in Tennessee. The UAW failed twice. Let's see if they can pull it off Friday. The six governors from Mississippi, Louisiana, West Virginia, Arkansas, Kentucky, Alabama, Oklahoma, and Texas, who wrote that letter all represent what are called right-to-work states, which means it's next to impossible for unions to survive in those states because if you belong to a union, you don't have to pay dues. So, right-to-work states. Those are right-to-work states, which is why Mississippi, Louisiana, West Virginia, Arkansas, Kentucky, Alabama, Oklahoma, and Texas lead the nation with the highest poverty rates in America. So tell me again, governors, how unions run counter to the values you live by. Apparently, the values these Republican governors live by is paying workers starvation wages. Tennessee, Chattanooga, Tennessee, is where the union vote is now taking place. Tennessee has no minimum wage law, which means their minimum wage is pegged to the federal minimum wage, which currently stands, or should I say sits, at $7.25 an hour. 
the federal minimum wage has not been raised since 2009. That means a single mother in Tennessee working a 40-hour work week as, oh, I don't know, a cashier at the dollar store or flipping burgers at McDonald's, she brings home $290 a week. After the Supreme Court overturned Roe in 2022, Tennessee enacted one of the most draconian anti-abortion laws in America. Abortion in Tennessee is illegal from the moment of fertilization, unless the mother's life is in jeopardy. Well, if you're pregnant and have to raise your kid on $290 a week, your life and your fetus's life is in jeopardy. So abort. By the way, one of the talking points you hear from Republicans is, you know, if you live in a state with a six-week abortion ban or a state like Tennessee where it's banned right after ejaculation, these Republicans say to just go to a state where abortions are legal. Uh-huh. So minimum wage in Tennessee is $7.25 an hour. These women are making $290 a week. You think anyone making $290 a week can afford the bus fare, the motel, and of course, the cost of an out-of-state abortion? They just don't care. These Republicans just don't care. And what? Do Republican politicians like Mike Johnson say to these women? Well, they say, have the baby. Have the baby. I played you the tape of Carrie Lake when she was running for governor in Arizona. She was saying, have the baby. We'll help you after you have the baby. Well, thanks to Republicans, the minimum wage hasn't been raised since 2009, which means... $290 a week is what a single mother gets paid to clean motel rooms or waiting tables, getting sexually harassed for tips. Tell me how you're helping single moms who kept their baby. A six-pack of Huggies diapers costs $50. Then again, on $290 a week, you're probably going through fewer diapers since it's not like you have any money to feed the kid. Speaker Mike Johnson finally, finally delivered articles of impeachment to the Senate, urging Majority Leader Democrat Chuck Schumer to convict Homeland Security Director Alejandro Mayorkas for what Republicans call his deliberate mishandling of this imaginary migrant crisis along our southern border. There are 11 impeachment managers, including the unhinged Marjorie Taylor Greene and the equally unhinged Louisiana Congressman Clay Higgins. With Democrats holding a 51 to 49 majority in the Senate, chances of an actual trial are slim to none. Republican Senator Mitt Romney has already said he would vote against proceeding with the trial. We are expecting the entire Senate to be sworn in as jurors later today, but all it takes is a simple majority of 51 votes to throw the entire case out. I think that's what's going to happen. I think that's what happens today. I don't think Chuck Schumer is going to dignify this impeachment, especially since we had a bipartisan border bill, the most transformative border bill in three decades, and Mike Johnson killed it on orders from Donald Trump because Donald Trump specifically told him, I need this imaginary migrant crisis to run on in November, so impeach Mayorkas. Use him as the scapegoat. Meanwhile, Speaker Mike Johnson is facing a revolt within his Republican caucus, and the revolt is being led by the revolting Marjorie Taylor Greene. Now, in the past... 
Mike Johnson has compared himself to Moses. This week, Mike Johnson told reporters that he is, quote, a wartime speaker. Really? A wartime speaker? Then why are you holding up funding for Ukraine? Why are you holding up funding for the Palestinians in Gaza, Mr. Wartime Speaker? Those are the only two wars I know of. Mike Johnson said to reporters, quote, I regard myself as a wartime speaker. I mean that in a literal sense, unquote. In a literal sense. He then mentioned former Speaker Newt Gingrich, who recently said Johnson faces the hardest challenges in the history of our country. Challenges, Mike Johnson added, that are comparable to the Civil War, but maybe worse. Mike Johnson said, I'm a wartime speaker facing challenges that are comparable to the Civil War, but maybe worse. He said that. He believes that. He believes as the speaker he faces challenges that could possibly be worse than the Civil War. What is going on inside this defective, demented mind of this backwater Louisiana hick? You think there's a Civil War, Mike Johnson? If you're so worried about a civil war here in America, Mike Johnson, it might be a good idea to lay down your arms and stop defending the insurrectionists who stormed our nation's capital on January 6. If this is in fact a civil war, then you and your orange turd Donald Trump are the ones who are causing it a civil war. If this is a civil war, Mike Johnson, I got news for you. You're not Abraham Lincoln. You're Jefferson Davis. As far as I can tell, Mike Johnson, the only civil war raging in this country is the one within the Republican Party. That's why they're throwing you out. There's a civil war inside the Republican Party. The only difference between that civil war that's going on right now in, in, in uh, the Republican Party and the original civil war in 1860, this time around, all the Republicans are for slavery. That's the only difference. If you recall, last month, Marjorie Taylor Greene was infuriated that Speaker Johnson worked with Democrats and finally passed the 2024 budget. So she introduced a motion to vacate the chair right before the Easter break. She didn't, however, and I'm going to just go into the, we the parliamentary weeds here for a second. She didn't make it privileged. Privileged means she would have walked the motion down to the House floor and delivered it personally. Now, according to parliamentary procedure, the House would then, if it were privileged, the House would then be forced to vote in two days on whether or not Mike Johnson has to vacate the chair. You might remember that back in November of last year, Marjorie filed a privileged resolution to impeach Alejandro Mayorkas, the head of Homeland Security. And that resolution, that impeachment resolution was voted down because it was privileged, which meant she only gave the House two days to vote, and they said, no, we don't have enough time. So her privileged resolution to impeach Alejandro Mayorkas failed back in November of last year. A different set of articles of impeachment for Mayorkas were passed on February 13th. Two months later, those articles of impeachment finally got delivered to the Senate. What's the rush? Biggest crisis facing America? The guy's responsible for it is Alejandro Mayorkas. The House impeaches him, and they wait two months to try to get the trial started. Anyway, Marjorie Taylor Greene's motion to vacate the chair before the Easter break was not 
privileged. She filed the motion so that it goes directly to the Rules Committee, where it essentially is left to die unless she reactivates that motion by going to the floor and filing it as privileged. Initially, before the Easter break, she said she filed this motion for Mike Johnson to vacate the chair as a warning shot. She was saying, the pink, I'm waving the pink slip, but I'm not firing you just yet. She specifically warned Mike Johnson back then, before the Easter break, that should Johnson introduce a Ukraine supplemental, then she would take the motion out of the Rules Committee, bring it to the floor, and force a vote on Mike Johnson, who has been Speaker now for six months. Yesterday, Mike Johnson announced he will introduce foreign aid bills to be voted on, including one for Ukraine. Johnson has been holding up the Ukraine supplemental since he became Speaker for six months. Biden has been trying to get weapons to Ukraine since August. The Senate has a version of the Ukraine supplemental that would provide roughly $60 billion in aid to Ukraine. And there is no question it would pass in the House. All the Democrats, every single Democrat, would vote for it. And because there are still a handful of Republicans not taking orders from Putin or Trump, it would, it would pass with a big majority. The president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, went on record last week and said, if the United States fails to vote in favor of the Ukraine supplemental, quote, we will lose the war, unquote. And that would all be, if, if they lose Ukraine, it would all be Mike Johnson's fault. That would be Mike Johnson's fault if Ukraine loses for six months, Johnson has been stalling Ukraine, the Ukraine supplemental. Now, as Ukraine appears to be losing, it's becoming increasingly apparent that should Russia win, it will be because of one man and one man only, Speaker Mike Johnson. It is Speaker Mike Johnson's fault if Ukraine falls because he refused to bring the supplemental to the floor for a vote because he knew it would pass. David Cameron was the conservative prime minister of Great Britain, and then Brexit happened. They took, the British voters took Brexit seriously, and he was no longer the uh, prime minister. Since November of last year, David Cameron has served as foreign secretary and prime minister Rishi Sunak's troubled conservative government. David Cameron flew to Mar-a-Lago last week urging Donald Trump, literally urging him to tell Republicans in the House, specifically Trump's stooge, Speaker Mike Johnson, to bring a vote on Ukraine, but Trump was unmoved. Cameron then flew to Washington, met with Joe Biden, and asked to meet with Speaker Mike Johnson and Speaker Mike Johnson refused to meet with him because Johnson was too busy filleting a Donald Trump blow-up doll. Johnson, Mike Johnson, is now forced to make a choice. He's got to choose between Trump and Putin or history. History is judging us, Mike Johnson, Actually, it's judging you. And he must ask himself, do I keep my speakership by catering to Putin, Trump, and the hard right isolationists by going down in history as the man who single-handedly lost Ukraine? Because I cannot stress this enough. The votes are there. He just will not bring the supplemental to the floor. If the Ukraine supplemental never gets voted on, that's on Johnson. So that's his question. Do I honor 
Putin and Trump, or do I offer up a momentary profile and courage, which means sacrificing my leadership role and bringing a vote on Ukraine to the floor? Johnson seems, it seems at least this morning, to have chosen history over Putin and Trump. So he might become history, as in they're going to send him out the door. But we'll see. How Johnson plans to go about introducing these foreign aid supplementals is interesting. He is honoring his commitment to the hard right, the Freedom Caucus, by stripping out the Senate's sprawling $95 billion foreign aid supplemental and allowing House members to vote on individual single-subject spending bills. When he was running for speaker, he promised to do this. This means funding for Ukraine won't be lumped in with spending for, for Taiwan, Israel, and humanitarian aid for the Palestinians. They bundle these spending bills together, and they force everybody's hands. You know, you, it's, uh, they say, well, I know you don't want to give money to Ukraine, but there's also money for Israel, so you got to vote for it. And then these Congress members go back to their constituents and say, I really didn't want to give money to Ukraine, but it was bundled in with the Israeli supplemental. This is how they force members of Congress to vote against their own wishes. Well, because of Mike Johnson, and partly because of Matt Gates of all people, Ukraine's funding bill, bill will be a standalone, a single subject, as will the Israel supplemental, as will the Taiwan supplemental, as will aid to Palestinians. Each one of those supplementals will be standalone bills. House members will not be given political cover to say, I had a vote for Ukraine because it was included in funding for Israel. I detest Mike Johnson because he detests me. But this is actually good governance. It's a return to what is called regular order, where members of the House are not bullied into ma passing these massive spending bills with absolutely no say. It's a return to committee chairs gaining power and influence. If Johnson's single subject bills make their way up to the Senate, instead of that sprawling supplemental, if members of the Senate then have to vote on these single subject uh, bills, members of the Senate will have to stake a claim, tell us where they stand. They will have to say where they stand specifically on each one of those funding bills. It, it will be interesting. Meanwhile, Ukraine needs that money since August. Johnson, this is where it gets really interesting. Johnson said he also plans to introduce the Repo Act. This would be a fourth bill, that the or maybe a fifth bill, that that House will vote on in which the hundreds of billions of dollars of Russian assets frozen in American banks after the invasion of Ukraine, those billions would be severed from the Russian oligarchs, including Vladimir Putin, and turned over to Ukraine. Think about this. The Repo Act, Mike Johnson, is suggesting that the billions hundreds of billions of dollars that were frozen, billions of dollars that was stolen by the Russian oligarchs from the Russian people, the, the billions that Putin stole. They, you know, we're a money laundering operation here in America. We are the single biggest money laundering operation in the world. We, we passed the Cayman Islands about seven years ago. So we were laundering money for these Russian oligarchs, and it's sitting there in our banks, and we froze their money. And the Repo Act is saying they're not going to get it back. Now, I don't see how this bill passes because <laughs> we're 
no oligarch would ever trust us again to launder money for them. But this is what Mike Johnson is introducing, the Repo Act. Uh, I'll believe it when I see it. Mike Johnson introducing the Repo Act. I can't imagine anything more fascinating than watching Republican members of the House of Representatives getting forced to vote on whether to strip Vladimir Putin of his frozen assets. Can you imagine House Republicans voting to take frozen assets, billions belonging to Vladimir Putin and his cronies, uh, to take his money that has been sitting in uh, American banks, to take it and hand it over to, to Zelensky? Who in the Republican Party would be willing to go on record in favor of taking, taking Putin's money there are polonium-tipped umbrellas waiting for every single member of the Republican caucus who violates Vladimir Putin's orders. It's a death sentence. So I don't know what Mike Johnson is planning. We do know that Vladimir Putin has purchased politicians throughout Europe to create chaos in the West to destabilize the West, and more recently, to undermine Western support for Ukraine. We know that for a fact. Before the invasion of Ukraine, Vladimir Putin has been buying up Western politicians, most probably the National Rifle Association as well. We know for a fact that back in 2016, Kevin McCarthy told the entire Republican conference that California Congressman Dana Rohrabacher was on Putin's payroll. Rohrabacher has since left Washington. He's no longer in Congress. But it was generally agreed that Dana Rohrabacher was taking money from Vladimir Putin. McCarthy then added, this was back in 2016, that Donald Trump was also on Vladimir Putin's payroll. This was 2016. Now, the next year, when Trump was sitting inside the Oval Office, McCarthy insisted he was joking. Sure he was. Last week, Republican chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Mike Turner, told CNN that House Republicans are, quote, absolutely repeating Russian propaganda on the chamber floor. Now, a few days before he made that statement, Mike McCall, he's the Republican chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, said, quote, Russian propaganda has made its way into the United States, unfortunately, and it's infected a good chunk of my party's Base. Well, is it Russian propaganda that's infecting the Republican Party, or is it Russian money? Probably both. Earlier this month, Mike Turner uh, said some things that were pretty damning about the Republican Party. The New Republic has an important article out this month entitled, Russia is buying politicians in Europe. Is it happening here too? You have to ask? Didn't you read the Mueller report? And the article features a picture of Marjorie Taylor Greene. As you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene has gone ballistic over Mike Johnson's decision to introduce a Ukraine supplemental on the House floor. She's furious because she knows it will pass. If it passes, Ukraine gets $60 billion in weapons, and they start beating up on Vladimir Putin. The other morning, Marjorie Taylor Greene appeared on Steve Bannon's radio show, his podcast, and she said 
she said it right out in the open. It's been two years since Russia invaded Ukraine. There is a Putin wing of the GOP, and they took about a year after the invasion to start nibbling around the edges and saying, you know, we need an inspector general to see where these weapons in Ukraine are going. And then as we approached the second year, they came out of the closet and were saying that they were rooting against Zelensky and for Putin. And people like Marjorie Taylor Greene are spelling out now exactly why they're rooting for Putin and against Zelensky. I told you what this was all about more than a year ago. Uh, I said that these Republicans are on the Putin payroll, but also, equally important, Christian nationalists like Marjorie Taylor Greene see Vladimir Putin as Europe's great white Christian hope in a war between Asia and Europe. It's a war, the white Christian nationalists in America, they see a war between white Christians and Muslims throughout Europe and parts of Asia. They see a war between white Christians and communist China. The Putin wing of the Republican Party sees Putin as the right-wing authoritarian they wish we had here in America. Someone, Putin, they wish we had someone like Putin who persecutes the LGBTQ community, cracks down on dissent, shuts down news organizations that make trouble for him. And most importantly, Putin is, just like most of the Republican Party, anti-democratic. Putin, like most Republicans, does not trust his citizens with the vote. He like most Republicans, prefer the pretense of a democracy instead of a real one. Trump would like to be Vladimir Putin. I think the closest we have in America is Ron DeSantis. The way he governs in Florida, he's the closest analog to Vladimir Putin. Let's... Let me go big here and read you what the defective, demented Marjorie Taylor Greene said to Steve Bannon about why she doesn't want to give money to Zelensky. Quote, but let's talk about what this really is, Steve. This is a war on Christianity. She's saying that the, the battle between Ukraine and Russia is a war on Christianity. Okay, as though Ukraine invaded Russia to wage war on Christianity. Quote, the Ukrainian government is attacking Christians. The Ukrainian government is executing priests. Russia is not doing that. <sighs> it's like a bad movie, isn't it? Green then praised Russia because they're not attacking Christianity. She said, they're not attacking Christianity. As a matter of fact, they are protecting Christianity. Yeah. I, I look at Vladimir Putin. I look into his eyes the way George W. Bush did, and I see a man of deep Christian faith. That's what George W. Bush said when he met with Putin. He said, I see a, a good Christian. Well, this is what Marjorie Taylor Greene told Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon, uh, you know, like Tucker Carlson, has not been shy about his boy crush on Hungary's Viktor Orban. And Viktor Orban has not been shy about his boy crush on Vladimir Putin. Ken Buck just quit the House of Representatives. He was one of two Republican members of the Freedom Caucus who voted to certify the election for Joe Biden. He's as close to a principled conservative you can find in Congress, which is why he's no longer there. 
he left about, a, what, two weeks ago, three weeks ago? Ken Buck, just like Intelligence Chair, Republican Mike Turner and Michael McCall, Republican Chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, they are warning that members of their Republican caucus are parroting Russian propaganda. Parroting Russian propaganda or taking money from Putin or both. Buck, Ken Buck specifically named Marjorie Taylor Greene. He recently told CNN, quote, Moscow Marjorie is focused now on Ukraine and getting her talking points from the Kremlin. Why? Why? Is it because she's such a good Christian? Or is she on the payroll? I'm not precisely sure what Mike Johnson is thinking this morning. I know Mike Johnson is in the thrall of Donald Trump, which means he has to be in the thrall of Vladimir Putin. So why would he introduce the Repo Act, which literally strips Putin and his cronies of their billions? Or is that just another way to stall the supplemental for Ukraine? There's a perfectly good bill passed in the Senate that would pass in the House. Is he doing what Trump does best, delaying and delaying and delaying, promising funding for Ukraine and then figuring out new ways to hold it up? I think that's probably what it is. Donald Trump has proven himself to be the master of delay. And I suspect that's what Mike Johnson is doing, figuring out ways to look like he wants to help Zelensky, but not exactly the way the Senate does. And the longer it takes to get that supplemental to Ukraine, the more land Russia takes. Meanwhile, Congressman Thomas Massey, a Republican from Kentucky with an isolationist streak, especially when it comes to foreign aid for Israel. He is against funding for Israel. He responded to news of Mike Johnson introducing a vote on Ukraine by announcing he will co-sponsor Marjorie Taylor Greene's motion for Mike Johnson to vacate the chair. Massey unlike Marjorie Taylor Greene, is not a joke. He is a well-respected member of Congress. He's got a master's in engineering from MIT. And Massey is done with Johnson. Yesterday, he called on Johnson to save Republicans the aggravation of going through another vote to vacate the chair and just leave. He said to Mike Johnson, just quit. Massey said, quote, The motion is going to get called, okay? Does anybody doubt that? The motion to vacate the chair will get called, and then Mike Johnson's going to lose more votes than Kevin McCarthy did, unquote. I didn't think this was going to happen. I, 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 before the Easter break, I didn't think the Republicans had an appetite for more infighting. Three weeks ago, after Johnson got pushback for passing that $1.2 trillion spending package and finally finishing up the 2024 budget, he got serious pushback and threats from the hard right. This is why it was, it was passing the 2024 budget. That's what triggered Marjorie Taylor Greene to file a motion for him to vacate the chair. Conventional wisdom was Republicans were going to take two weeks off for Easter. They were going to come, they were going to calm down, come back, and not risk another meltdown like the one we saw six months ago after they got rid of Kevin McCarthy and almost destroyed themselves looking for a replacement. Do you remember the little civil war between uh, Jim Jordan? and uh, 
the majority leader, Steve Scalise, do you remember the death threats found into members of Congress who wouldn't vote for Jim Jordan for speaker? Remember that? Why do you think so many Republicans are quitting in the middle of the Congress? It was partly because of all the death threats that were phoned in to them because they wouldn't support Jim Jordan. So it was assumed before the Easter break that even though Marjorie Taylor Greene had filed a motion to vacate, cooler heads would prevail. Well, Massey is one of those cooler heads, and now he's pushing for Johnson to go. Mike Johnson said yesterday he's not quitting, he's staying put. He said he's not going to resign. He called it absurd that hardline conservatives in the Republican Party, like Massey, would force him out merely for bringing bills to the floor. Johnson said he should not be punished for doing what he's supposed to do, letting people vote. So here's the pickle Mike Johnson is in. And and because it's Mike Johnson, let me clarify, he is in the pickle. The pickle is not in Mike Johnson. He's very touchy about those things. He's in the pickle. He's not a bottom. Here's the pickle that Mike Johnson finds himself in. He has a two-vote majority. All it takes is two Republicans to vote him out. He's gone. But wait, it gets worse. On Friday, Wisconsin Republican Mike Gallagher heads for the exits. And that leaves Johnson with a one-vote majority. All it takes is just Marjorie Taylor Greene or or Massey to flip and Johnson's gone. I always thought Johnson would survive, but these Republicans are vicious. They're not just vicious to the poor and the most vulnerable among us. They are vicious to each other as well. Gallagher, by the way, Congressman Gallagher of Wisconsin, took his time quitting. He timed it perfectly to punish Mike Johnson. He called it quits just days after the cutoff period when Wisconsin uh, can call a special election to replace him. In other words, he waited until the deadline passed so his seat would remain empty. No special election to replace him. The deadline passed. Nobody is replacing Mike Gallagher. That seat remains empty for the remainder of this Congress. So... As Massey said, if they vote for Johnson, or if they vote on whether or not Johnson should vacate the chair, I, I, kind of surprised to be saying this, Johnson doesn't stand a chance. The same way we know that if Johnson lets the House of Representatives vote on the Ukraine supplemental, it will pass. We know that if Marjorie Taylor Greene and Massey introduce a motion to vacate the chair, Mike Johnson is gone. The question is, will they introduce the motion to vacate the chair? They hold Mike Johnson's destiny in their hands. However, however, so does Democrat Hakeem Jeffries, who is currently the minority leader in the House, he might come to Johnson's aid. Hakeem Jeffries has hinted that should Johnson bring the Ukraine supplemental to the floor, Hakeem Jeffries has intimated that he would provide enough votes for Johnson to keep his speakership when Republicans retaliate by holding a vote to vacate the chair. This would not be the first time Jeffries came to Johnson's rescue or uh, his predecessor, Kevin McCarthy's rescue. 
There would be no 2024 budget had Jeffries not provided the votes to get it past the finish line. In fact, despite Republicans controlling the House since January of 2023, in the past year, there have been four times that Hakeem Jeffries, Democratic minority leader, came to Johnson's rescue as well as Kevin McCarthy's. You might remember back in June of last year, the House grudgingly raised the debt ceiling by passing the Financial Responsibility Act. Even though Kevin McCarthy was Speaker, more Democrats voted for the Fiscal Responsibility Act, which raised the debt ceiling. More Democrats voted for it than Republicans. And that infuriated Republicans. Right there is when the seeds of Kevin McCarthy's demise were planted. Then, when the 2024 budget had to be passed by October 1st, and McCarthy didn't have one, he needed a continuing resolution. More Democrats in the House voted for McCarthy's continuing resolution than Republicans. And that's when McCarthy was shown the door. He was shown the door because he worked with Democrats. You're not allowed to work with Democrats. Then there was the second continuing resolution that Mike Johnson needed. And again, Hakeem Jeffries delivered the majority. More Democrats voted for that second continuing resolution than Republicans. And then we finally got the 2024 budget passed. And they did that by passing that $1.2 trillion spending package. That was the final bill that had to be passed to finish up the 2024 budget right before the Easter break. And... In order for that to pass, Mike Johnson needed Democrats. And more Democrats voted for it than Republicans. So, it is not inconceivable that Hakeem Jeffries has told Mike Johnson, if you bring Ukraine to the floor for a vote, I got your back. I know they're going to retaliate and they're going to file a motion to vacate the chair. I don't need to be speaker now. You're going to, you guys are going to get wiped out in November. I'll wait till January of 2025 to become speaker. You step up, provide the money for Ukraine. I got your back. Donald Trump also has Mike Johnson's back. And now that Trump's the presumptive nominee, he's running the show with House Republicans. He is the speaker. Uh, He's not running the show in the Senate. Senate Republican, Mitch McConnell, he's not taking orders from Donald Trump. But Trump is the speaker of the House. He's calling the shots with House Republicans. Last week... Business Insider reported that Trump and his surrogates are getting really tired of Marjorie Taylor Greene, especially because she's threatening Mike Johnson's speakership. That's a direct challenge, not just of Mike Johnson, but of Donald Trump's authority. So I don't know what's going on between Mike Johnson and Donald Trump. I don't know, I don't believe that Mike Johnson wants to fund Ukraine. As I said earlier, I think he's just figuring out new ways to to stall. There's even talk of a lend-lease program where we lend Ukraine weapons and then they have to pay us back. That's DOA, according to Democrats, but it's something that Trump has suggested. So I think... 
this spitballing, like a Lend-Lease program or the Repo Act, where we unfreeze the Russian assets and give them to uh, Zelensky, I just think these are just new ways to delay, delay, delay until Donald Trump becomes president and he completely cuts off Ukraine. That's what I think is really going on here. That's what I think Mike Johnson is doing. He's just vamping, stalling. But there is a motion for him to vacate the chair. Uh, If he genuinely cares about Ukraine and introduces a single subject supplemental for Ukraine, I have to believe that would be a deal breaker for Donald Trump. We we know that Trump gets his orders directly from Putin, and there is no way Donald Trump can allow the Ukraine supplemental to get voted on. I don't know what Trump and Johnson are working out. I do know Trump was a huge supporter of Marjorie Taylor Greene's, especially when she was stripped of all her committee assignments during Pelosi's speakership. Since she had nothing to do, she came into Congress, Marjorie Taylor Greene, she was already involved with January 6th. She was already meeting in the Trump White House to overturn the election. She hadn't even been sworn in yet as a member of Congress. And then she got sworn in and got immediately stripped of all her committee assignments because... On social media, she had propagated ideas on uh, killing Nancy Pelosi. So she lost all her committee assignments. She had nothing to do for the two years. Her first two years in office, she had nothing to do. So Trump asked Marjorie, hey, come, come open for me at my rallies. And thanks to Marjorie's close relationship with Trump, she accrued political power that manifested itself when Kevin McCarthy assumed the speakership and he had to placate Trump and he placated Trump by giving Marjorie choice committee assignments, House oversight. Marjorie, though, never happy. She's one of those people who's just miserable and needs to lash out no matter what you do for her she will still be miserable, and she feels rebuffed by Mike Johnson, who sees her as just some crackpot he has to placate. Mike Johnson also understands Marjorie takes her orders from Donald Trump, and he figures that Trump can control Marjorie Taylor Greene. Can he? Can Trump control Marjorie Taylor Greene. Mike Johnson thinks so. It's why he flew down to Mar-a-Lago last week to hold what he called high-level talks with Trump so they could unveil some nonsense bill to stop undocumented workers from being allowed to vote. Uh, Why don't you also work on a bill that provides Social Security for senior citizens? We already... Undocumented workers already are not allowed to vote, but that was the pretense for going down there. The real point of the meeting was to show renegade Republicans like Marjorie Taylor Greene that Trump has Mike Johnson's back. But apparently, Marjorie didn't get the message. This week, she's sticking with plans to get rid of Mike Johnson. Why? Why? Why is she disobeying Donald Trump? She's angry at Donald Trump. She's angry because she's delusional. She thought, and I'm not making this up, this cretin honestly thought Donald Trump was going to pick her as his running mate. And there has been a lot of tension between Marjorie Taylor Greene and another delusional sociopath, 
Arizona's very own Carrie Lake, who, after losing the race for governor in 2022, is now running for the Senate in Arizona. Last Labor Day, it became apparent that both Carrie Lake and Marjorie Taylor Greene were hanging out at Mar-a-Lago, staying at Mar-a-Lago, sucking up to Donald Trump, courting him, thinking he was going to pick them, one of them, to be vice president. And Donald Trump loves playing people against one another. And he convinced Marjorie Taylor Greene and he convinced Carrie Lake that he was seriously considering them as running mates. Now, as insane as that sounds, look who's deciding who his running mate is going to be, Donald Trump. Yes, it's insane to think that Marjorie Taylor Greene or Carrie Lake would be considered for the number two spot But look who's got the number one spot, Donald Trump. And by the way, who is he going to pick as his running mate? That's uh, for another show. Anyway, Marjorie Taylor Greene, I heard, was incensed that Trump would even consider Carrie Lake for her job as vice president. These women are delusional, as is Trump. But Trump actually became president. But Marjorie Taylor Greene was out of her mind, well, even more out of her mind, that she could lose (laughs) the number two spot to Carrie Lake. And and Marjorie Taylor Greene was walking around Mar-a-Lago saying, she ran for governor Uh, she's never held elective office and she ran for governor in 2022 and she lost. Uh, Whereas I, Marjorie Taylor Greene, am now serving my second term in Congress. And I sit on the House Oversight Committee. Sometimes I wear glasses to look smart. Marjorie was threatened by Carrie Lake and set out to undermine her. Uh, Marjorie is not as bright as Carrie Lake. Carrie Lake is a a mental defective, uh, but she would read a teleprompter as a news anchor in Arizona. She knew how to read a a, a teleprompter. She's much smarter than Marjorie Taylor Greene, but Marjorie Taylor Greene's a street fighter and has really sharp elbows. Being smarter and more eloquent in Trump world, in the Republican Party, sharper elbows. That's all that matters. So down at Mar-a-Lago, where both Marjorie and, and Carrie Lake were hanging out, it got ugly. And Carrie Lake reportedly accused Marjorie of leaking negative stories about her in the press. And Trump was watching all of this and just laughing. He, What pleases Donald Trump more than two women fighting over him. And a Carrie Lake snap that you've been uh, leaking negative stories about me in the press. And Marjorie Taylor Greene said, that's not true. I, I have never leaked any bad stories about you in the press. And then immediately began telling members of the press that Carrie Lake is a grifter, which is... Uh, kinder than what Marjorie Taylor Greene called Lauren Boebert, the beleaguered congresswoman from Colorado. Poor Lauren Boebert. Uh, After Lauren Boebert, I've talked about this. After Lauren Boebert, Marjorie Taylor Greene introduced articles of impeachment for Joe Biden. She's the OG on the Biden impeachment. And instead of co-sponsoring Marjorie Taylor Greene's impeachment, uh, articles of impeachment. Lauren Boebert introduced her own articles of impeachment for Joe Biden, and Marjorie Taylor Greene was incensed. She 
accused Boebert of stealing her articles of impeachment word for word. She accused her of just copying and pasting her articles of impeachment. Marjorie, this is true. Marjorie cornered Lauren Boebert on the floor of the House, walked up to her and said, quote, you know, you're a little bitch, unquote. The argument literally spilled into the congressional ladies' room. I'm not making this up. Uh, and it got very ugly. Then after Lauren Boebert, and I'm not making this up because I don't want to use this language. I'm, I'm quoting Marjorie Taylor Greene. After Lauren Boebert got thrown out of the musical Beetlejuice, remember that? She was feeling up her boyfriend and he was feeling her up at Beetlejuice. Marjorie Taylor Greene would not stop calling Lauren Boebert a whore. It got to the point where they had it. They said, would you please stop? It went from calling her a little bitch to a whore. That's Marjorie Taylor Greene. And Marjorie never was a happy person. These days, she feels isolated, marginalized, and betrayed by Donald Trump. She bet the wrong horse. She bet it all on Kevin McCarthy. And it didn't, he didn't win. And, you know, uh, she thought, because she's delusional, she thought she was part of Donald Trump's inner circle. And she's beginning to realize he was using her. Marjorie feels scorned, and unless Trump offers her something, obviously it's not going to be the number two spot, but he's got to, he's got to please Marjorie Taylor Greene. She has, you have to feed that bottomless need for recognition that she has. Unless Donald Trump can figure out a way to placate her, she will take it all out on Mike Johnson. Because Marjorie Taylor Greene is just like Donald Trump. She's a wrecking ball. She's not as smart as Donald Trump, but she is a, a wrecking ball, and nothing would please her more than destroying Mike Johnson. She's a very destructive person. She doesn't care who she hurts as long as she's hurting somebody. Johnson threw her a bone, Yesterday, Marjorie got to take the lead as one of the House impeachment managers walking the articles of impeachment for Alejandro Mayorkas into the Senate. But that would never be good enough for Marjorie Taylor Greene because she knows she'll be marginalized if the Senate somehow agrees to a trial. She's an impeachment manager name only. Impeachment managers are lawyers, She's not a lawyer. She's a gym rat. So Trump knows Marjorie needs something, a real sign of respect and responsibility. I'm just going to throw this out. I'm just spitballing here. It would not surprise me if, to save Mike Johnson's speakership, it would not surprise me if she's about to be promised a committee chair. She's going to be chairman of a committee, chairwoman of a committee. Uh, hear me out. I'm guessing Homeland Security chair. Now, right now, Mark Green of Tennessee is chairman of the Homeland Security Committee. He announced his retirement right after getting the Mayorkas impeachment passed in the House. He went, I'm done. I'm out of here. But then he got a call from Trump telling him, you're not leaving. I need you in the House. So Green is staying. Uh, uh, Mark Green is staying in the House. He wants to get out. Trump won't let him leave. So it wouldn't surprise me if a different Green, Marjorie Taylor Green, suddenly became chairwoman of the Homeland Security Committee. Marjorie's so stupid, you could just tell her she already is the chair 
of Homeland Security. See, Chairman Green, she wouldn't. Oh, I guess I am. I think she's going to get. Uh, I think she's going to get a, a chair between now and July. That's what I think. How are we doing on time here? All right. What do I do? I got to get this stuff off my desk because it festers. So give me a little more time. Earlier in the week, I told you how Joe Biden is working to bring down the cost of groceries by filing a lawsuit. And I'm going to get to the Trump trial, by the way. So hang in there. And we have a poll. Earlier in the week, I told you how our president is bringing down the cost of groceries. He's doing it by filing a lawsuit that would block the merger of Albertsons with Kroger's, which, if allowed, would create the largest supermarket chain in America. This is big. This is how you fight inflation. The Biden administration's Federal Trade Commission filed the suit, and in the filing, they claim this merger would create fewer choices for consumers, which would result in the new company being able to raise grocery prices even higher than they already are. This is what is causing inflation, uh, especially when it comes to groceries and junk food, pricing power, monopolies, And now the Washington Post reports this morning that the Biden Justice Department is about to file an antitrust lawsuit against concert promoter Live Nation, which also owns Ticketmaster. Ticketmaster. Does anybody like Ticketmaster? Performers, promoters, fans, we all hate Ticketmaster. Everybody knows that Ticketmaster has unfairly cornered the market in ticket sales for prominent venues, resulting in price gouging, making live entertainment out of reach for far too many Americans. Senate hearings back in January of 2023 looking into Live Nation's business practices resulted in representatives from both sides of the aisle accusing Live Nation of monopolistic pricing. This is kind of important, going after the monopolies. There is a consensus emerging between Republicans and Democrats to break up the monopolies. You'll hear Josh Hawley, you'll hear a lot of Republicans talking about breaking up Apple and big tech. Breaking up the big companies, and I I think so much of our immiseration in America has been caused by companies that are too big to fail. Breaking up these big companies is a long and arduous task, especially ever since Robert Bork began serving in the Nixon administration, first as Solicitor General, and then after the Saturday Night Massacre, he became Acting Attorney General. Because of Bork, it has been the Justice Department's policy to only break up corporations when lack of competition results in higher prices for consumers. Bork is the author of a famous book called The Antitrust Paradox. He is the reason the Justice Department for the past 40-some-odd years viewed antitrust enforcement as something solely for the welfare of the consumer. In other words, the Justice Department wasn't going to break up any monopolies unless the consumer benefited from it with lower prices. In other words, the Justice Department wasn't breaking up monopolies for 40 years. The Justice Department... for 40 years, could not justify breaking up a corporation just because it had been gobbling up smaller companies and had gotten too big to compete with. And 
affecting the labor market. This was all about consumers, not about workers. See, when Albertsons and Kroger's, if they're allowed to merge, not only will they be giving, be, be able to charge more, they're going to put tens of thousands of union workers, they're going to throw them to the streets. So antitrust enforcement only benefited consumers for the past 40 years, not workers. And we all know when companies are allowed to merge, the workers suffer. So the policy, because of Bork, has been what is best for consumers. Since inflation spiked under COVID, corporate balance sheets revealed immense pricing power due to very little competition, which has now prompted the Biden Justice Department as well as the Biden Federal Trade Commission to bork impending mergers, to bork them in the name of consumer welfare. And we're seeing this now with the Justice Department going after Live Nation, demanding to know why a concert promoter like Live Nation is allowed somehow to own Ticketmaster and why uh, it's in the best interests of consumers. We're talking about Albertsons merging with Kroger's, it's they're they're using Bork's logic to to go after Ticketmaster and Albertsons and Kroger's. But what about the workers? What about breaking up these corporations to benefit workers? Certainly in Hollywood, they're like three studios. They call three three. Studio heads call all the shots. That's bad for workers. Anyway, on, I rambled there, but it's important. On Tuesday, Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, hinted that he's reversing course slightly in his battle to rein in inflation. A few weeks ago, Powell hinted that he was about to bring down borrowing costs by lowering interest rates. Powell hinted that inflation seemed to be under control and there was no need to try to slow the economy down by making it more expensive to borrow money. Rate cuts are generally considered good for business because it makes it cheaper for businesses to invest in new equipment and expand their operations. The stock market began hitting record highs, betting rate cuts were imminent. But on Tuesday, yesterday, after new inflation numbers that came out last week indicated consumer prices are ticking up at a slightly faster rate than Powell wants, Powell signaled that he is not yet prepared for a rate cut. It's worth noting that Inflation is hovering above 3%. Under Jimmy Carter, it was like 14.5%. Don't compare Biden to Jimmy Carter. We got 3% inflation. It's worrisome. It's only 1% higher than where the Fed wants it to be. Meanwhile, the economy is posting record job numbers, as well as, well as the longest economic expansion in at least 60 years, perhaps, in American history. By any measure, this economy is probably the best economy America has ever had. With a new Wall Street Journal survey of economists concluding we are the envy of the world. All right. The stock market, as I said, has been down the past few days after those disappointing inflation numbers. Trump media closed down more than 14% on Tuesday. This after losing 18% on Monday. Now, I want to talk to the MAGA morons who listen to this show. Now, you got to trust me on this. I have this friend, John Ross, who is a really smart investor really smart and cautious. He lives in his car. This is one of the things I've 
noticed about John Ross. He lives in his car. He says because he insists the rental market is overvalued. He's telling me now, right now, is when you borrow whatever you can and buy up stock in Trump media. If you love Donald Trump, and I know I've got a lot of MAGA morons, listen to me. If you have a credit card, my MAGA morons get a cash advance right now. I know a cash advance is like 30% interest on a cash advance, but you're, you're thinking small. You get the cash advance and then let it all ride on Trump media. My friend John Ross, and he knows these things. He does his own research. He says Trump media is going to sell for double in two weeks. He explained it to me. He does his own research. It makes sense. Trump media, he says, has gone down 60% in the past two weeks. John Ross says the jealousy of Donald Trump is now baked into the price of the stock. He says Trump envy is uh, what investors call already discounted, already in the stock. John said all the haters have pummeled the Trump stock, Trump media stock, because they're jealous of Donald Trump's long, flowing blonde hair and his boyish good looks. And, of course, because Donald Trump is smart and has it all. John says, and he does his, he knows this stuff, he says the haters have been wrung out of the stock. That's what he said. The haters have been wrung out of the stock. Sounds pretty smart, right? He says, now when you look at Trump media, it's only about the fundamentals. And this is why John is so bullish on Trump media stock. So I know I have MAGA morons who are listening, okay? This is when you let it all ride on Trump media because the smart investors are now beginning to take a second look at Trump media with a clear head. Now they're looking at just the numbers. No emotion because the, the hatred for Trump has been wrung out of the stock. That's what John said. It's been wrung out of the stock. And what John says is what you have right now is Trump media selling, trading with a negative 45 price to earnings ratio. John says he's not quite sure what a price to earning ratio means, but he says negative 45 sounds impressive, especially since Trump was the 45th president of the United States of America. I mean, John, you know, he's on the QAnon boards, the chat rooms. He says... You're going to kick yourself if you don't take advantage of this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to secure a brighter future for you and your loved ones. Let it all ride on Trump media. How many kidneys you got inside of you? Do you know what they pay in Thailand for one of your kidneys? You only need one kid. You're kind of being greedy. Hop on a flight to Thailand, sell a kidney, and let the profits from your kidney, let it all ride on Trump media. My friend, John, says Trump media is safer than gold. Safer than gold. And John is all about safety when it comes to investing. He's very cautious and prudent. It's why he lives in his car. He says the rental market right now is overvalued. That's how cautious an investor John is. He's saying, live in your car, wait for the rental market to come crashing down, and that's when you swoop in and rent yourself an apartment. So Trump media, let it all ride on Trump media. I know we have MAGA morons listening right now. 
whatever you got, let it ride on Trump media. By the way, Trump media, as I said, tumbled Tuesday after it was announced that Trump media would begin a streaming service that provides family-friendly videos, many of which will be Christian-themed. And if you've been following Donald Trump's criminal trial in Manhattan this week, you know, it's almost like a scene out of a movie on the Hallmark Channel, isn't it? I mean, everything about Donald Trump screams family-friendly and God-fearing. So Trump media, now they're getting into live streaming, family-friendly videos that are Christian-themed. There's a lot of money in Christian-themed videos. Bet it all. This is the mop-up for April 17th, 2024. I'm David Feldman in Manhattan. Thank you for finding me. We have a poll in the chat room. All right. The Trump trial, and then I'm done. It was day two yesterday for Donald Trump in a Manhattan courtroom. Trump woke up and immediately took to social media, calling the gag order, preventing him from attacking witnesses, uh, including the judge's daughter, he called the gag order unconstitutional. A new Associated Press poll out this morning shows half of all Americans say if Donald Trump gets convicted in any of the four criminal trials... Half of America says that would make him unfit to serve as president. Only half of Americans think that would make him unfit. When you dig down deeper, 47% of independent voters said they wouldn't vote for Trump if he gets convicted, while only 15% of Republicans said a conviction would disqualify him. Jury selection continued in the Manhattan courtroom where Donald Trump is on trial for falsifying documents and violating campaign finance laws when he paid hush money to Stormy Daniels in the lead up to the 2016 presidential election. If the Manhattan district attorney wins a conviction, many think the charges of violating federal campaign finance laws may not stick after it runs through the appeals process. There is the issue of jurisdiction. Can a local district attorney like Alvin Bragg, Manhattan DA, prosecute a presidential candidate for violating federal law, especially since that law... uh, It has not been established in a federal courtroom that that federal law has, in fact, been violated by Donald Trump. Trump's lawyers are arguing this trial doesn't belong in a local courtroom. The appeals judges, including Judge Juan Mershon, who's presiding over this, they say it does. Uh, So... The federal violating campaign finance law, that's going to be a hard conviction to to make that stick in the appeals process, I believe. But this trial is more than just about federal campaign finance law. It's also about forging business documents, which unquestionably falls under the purview of the Manhattan district attorney. And by the way, Michael Cohen got sentenced to three years Uh, one of the reasons he went to prison was violating federal campaign finance law. So it stuck with him. It wasn't a jurisdictional issue with Michael Cohn. These indictments that came down uh, are about a year old. And some have called it the weakest of Trump's four criminal trials. But while this may not be damaging to Trump in terms of actually doing prison time, it does have the potential to damage him politically. As I said on yesterday's show, this trial is about sex. It's salacious, which means low-information voters, 
i.e. Republicans, can and will follow this. They'll pretend they're worried about the persecution of Donald Trump or, you know, democracy, whatever. <clears throat> this is about sex. Sex with a porn star and sex with a Playboy playmate. The trial in Miami over Trump's violating the Espionage Act or the trial in Washington, D.C. over Trump's election interference, both of them are slam dunks for the prosecutors. There's absolutely no question Donald Trump mishandled classified documents. There's absolutely no question Trump tried to overturn the 2020 election results, which is why the RICO trial down in Georgia is also a slam dunk for prosecutors. There's a reason Trump is spending millions delaying all three of those trials, because those three trials carry with them multiple years in prison. Although the classified documents trial down in Miami That will be the easiest one to prove Trump's guilt. Most legal experts tell me they are dubious as to whether or not he could end up doing time for mishandling those documents. The trials in Washington, D.C. and Georgia, however, Trump is looking at prison. He's looking at prison. So in the pantheon of Trump's criminal trials, the one going on right now inside that Manhattan criminal courtroom, that will be the one that's most difficult to get a conviction and to make it stick. And we're not going to see him going to prison. We're just not. He's just not going to go to prison over this. Politically, however... The low information, conservative Republicans, the deeply religious evangelical Trump supporters are going to be following this trial that's going on right now. And they're going to be reminded of the kind of sleazeball Donald Trump is. I'm not talking about his being a sleazeball in business or politics. And for many in America... Some people forgive bad behavior in business and politics. But this trial is about Trump's sleazy behavior with the people he purportedly loves. In this Manhattan courtroom, Trump's character is on trial. And over the next eight weeks, there is going to be some seriously unflattering testimony that will probably convince many deeply religious Republicans to stay home on Election Day. We're going to hear testimony from Stormy Daniels, who Trump had sex with right after Melania gave birth. Sex without a condom. Now, the jurors are not allowed to know he had sex with Stormy Daniels right after Melania gave birth or that it was without a condom. But it's part of the public record. And there are Republicans who take those things very seriously. We're going to meet Karen McDougal, the Playboy Playmate. Trump had sex with while Melania was pregnant with their son. Again, Judge Mershon on Monday ruled that the jurors are not allowed to know Melania was pregnant when Trump cheated on her with Karen McDougal. Trump's lawyers said, there's no way (laughs) we'll get a, a fair trial if the jury learns that Donald Trump cheated on Melania with a Playboy Playmate while Melania was pregnant. Well, this is now part of the public record. I didn't realize this until yesterday when they were fighting it out. Politically, this is as bad as it could possibly get 
for any other presidential candidate except Donald Trump. Oh, and by the way, last year a jury found Donald Trump guilty of rape. Just want to remind you of that. And then, in this trial, we're going to hear testimony from Dino Sajudin, the doorman at Trump Tower, who prosecutors say Trump paid $30,000 to keep his mouth shut, to keep his mouth shut about Trump fathering a child out of wedlock with one of the cleaning ladies at Trump Tower. Trump, according to prosecutors, paid the doorman at Trump Tower $30,000 not to talk about a child that Donald Trump fathered out of wedlock with one of the cleaning ladies at Trump Tower, which is probably the only egalitarian thing Donald Trump has ever done in his life. How will this information play with the deeply religious Christian evangelicals who put him in the White House back in 2016? Okay, Putin put him in the White House, but the evangelicals helped. So far, nobody's saying Trump paid for anybody's abortion, which means the evangelicals will view Trump as a sinner, but they'll vote for him anyway. He's not going to lose a single evangelical Christian from anything that comes out of this trial unless we learn there was an abortion or Donald Trump had sex with another man. So he's good with the evangelicals. But this election will be decided by suburban women living in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. If you want to know how Trump or Biden gets to 270, it's up to suburban women living in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. More importantly, white suburban women in those three states. Biden has a lock on suburban women of color. Uh, Biden and Trump are in a dead heat with uh, white suburban women in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Biden just needs to win a couple of them over or convince enough of the ones who are partial to Trump that they should probably stay home on election day. Will this trial convince white suburban women in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, they're not going to vote for Biden, but will they be so disgusted by this that they just can't bring themselves to cast a ballot in November? So when you're following this trial, and we're all going to be following it because it's about sex, Ask yourself, filter this information through the prism of how will white suburban women in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania feel about Donald Trump after they hear about how he treated Melania and how he treated Karen McDougal, the Playboy Playmate, and Stormy Daniels, we know about the death threats that were made to Stormy Daniels. As of Tuesday, it now looks like six jurors have been approved. Six have been sworn in, which means prosecutors and Trump's attorneys now have to agree on just six more and a few alternate jury jurors. If jury selection continues at this clip, we could hear opening statements as early as Monday. We may have a verdict after Memorial Day. 500 potential jurors 
have shown up to the courthouse waiting to be vetted by the prosecutors and the defense attorneys. By Tuesday morning, 96 potential jurors were brought into the courtroom. Half were immediately dismissed when they said they couldn't be impartial. Of 96, they ended up with six. Trump has been stink-eyeing prospective jurors, staring them down. You know, he... Uh, he's looking at them saying, I know who you are. And the judge is very angry about this. I'll get to that in a second. Trump also dozed off once again. What? How heavily medicated is he? Is he on horse tranquilizer? Uh Trump complained that many of the prospective jurors were biased and prejudicial. So what's he whining about? Biased and prejudicial describes everyone who ever voted for him. The goal here is to narrow it all down to 12 jurors. And lawyers for Trump drew ire from the presiding judge, Juan Mershon, who ruled that it's improper to ask prospective jurors if they like Donald Trump. The judge ruled such a question is irrelevant. And yet, throughout the day, Trump's lawyers continue to ask prospective jurors, do you like Donald Trump? What kind of question is that to ask in New York City? Because if not liking Donald Trump automatically disqualifies someone from sitting on this jury, nobody would be sitting on this jury because we all hate Donald Trump. Everybody hates Donald Trump. Trump was reprimanded by the judge after Trump appeared to be angrily talking to himself while his attorney questioned a potential juror. Judge Mershon said, you are intimidating the juror. He said, quote, I will not tolerate that. I will not have jurors intimidated in this courtroom. I want to make that crystal clear, unquote. Judge Mershon then ordered Trump's attorney, Todd Blanche, get control of your client. And then Trump's attorneys expressed concern over several jurors' social media posts, which they called inappropriate. Yeah, because Donald Trump's social media posts are so tame. Meanwhile, Trump got a much-needed assist from America's mayor, Rudy Giuliani, who took to social media yesterday and pointed out that Judge Juan Mershon, the presiding judge in this case, was born in Colombia and came to America at the age of six. Rudy called the judge a disgrace, who, quote, is not a judge in the tradition of Anglo-American jurists. He's, he's saying that basically the judge is Colombian and he is not a judge in the tradition of Anglo-American jurists jurists. Rudy made the comments in case we had forgotten what a piece of human excrement he is. You know, these are the worst people. The worst. All of them. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. I'm going to do some housekeeping here. We have a poll. Let me go into the chat room and while I'm trying to find the, there we go. Okay. Uh, Hello, piece of human Hello, everybody. Is. Okay, so we have a poll. If you're watching me live on YouTube right now, please jump into the chat room and fill out the poll. We have a very simple question. Who will be speaker on June 1st, 2024? Will it be Mike Johnson, Hakeem Jeffries, Donald Trump? Or Vladimir Putin. So far, we have 2,116 votes. I'm going to leave the poll open for 20 seconds. Let me 
I've learned to thank the super chats. So let me thank the super chats. Uh, Kaiit, oh, hang on, let me go to the top here. Uh, Dean, video game controller poses triumphantly in between the words critical hit. Okay. Yap Van Mujden. I'm going to assume he's from the Netherlands. Your show is the perfect West Coast nightcap. Thank you for all your work. Thank you, Jap. Yap. K. Stengem. Uh, Mike Johnson is going to lose his speakership. Hakeem needs to be speaker. And f- we have Doug McMeckin. Uh, pure character exaggeratedly stretching his arm forward to offer a cup of coffee. I got to learn what these super chats mean. And Kai. Kait Az Austral, Ms. Spock, Super Chat. Uh, move over Taylor Swift and the Swifties. David Feldman and the Felmanites are on their way. Love from Australia. Hello, Australia. Take me. Give me your citizenship. Let's swap citizenship. And finally, Carol Knowles, PhD. Love David's wicked alter ego. Okay, thank you. Those are the super chats. If you enjoyed any of this, please share this episode with your friends and your family by copying and pasting the link to this show and placing it in a email, a text, or on so, uh, social media. Like this episode, subscribe to my newsletter, subscribe to my channel. This is an audio podcast. So take me with you on your next drive. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. Here we go. Who will be speaker on June 1st, 2024? 2,192 votes. At the bottom, number four with 4%, Donald Trump. There was talk. Uh, Troy Nels and Marjorie Taylor Greene talked about making him a, a temporary speaker. 4% think he'll be a speaker on June 1st. Coming in third, Vladimir Putin. (laughs) Vladimir Putin, according to my audience, has a better chance of becoming speaker than Trump. Coming in second is Mike Johnson with 20%. And 58%, we have a majority, 58%. Of 2,211 listeners watching me live right now on YouTube, 58% say Hakeem Jeffries will be speaker on June 1st, 2024. And great show from Depleted Uranium Cowboy. Thank you for all the super chats. Thank you to Bob uh, for keeping the conversation civil. Always leave a comment here, uh, unless you're a MAGA supporter. Thank you all, and maybe tomorrow, maybe, I'm getting my energy back, maybe tomorrow. Thank you for listening.